Today we're going to look at a pretty aesthetic problem. So let's say we've got a right triangle and I've just said that the side lengths are A, B with hypotenuse C. And then, well, we inscribe infinitely many squares. Maybe we could say tumbling towards that angle over there. So we've got this big square that's inscribed in the largest triangle. And then let's observe that that cuts off a smaller triangle down here. And we inscribe this, well, second largest square in that next triangle. And then so on and so forth as we go down. So maybe before we get started, let's introduce just a tad bit of notation. So I've already set up here that we have side lengths A, B, and C. But now let's say that these squares have side length x1, and then this next one is x2, and then this next one is, well, you guessed it, x3, and then this next one is x4 and x5, and then so on and so forth. So that trails off infinitely small down there. But observe under this setting, our goal is pretty clearly equal to, well, the sum of the squares of these xi's. So in other words, our goal is calculating this thing, which is, well, the area of all of the squares, which is x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared plus dot, dot, dot. And now, before digging into this problem, it's unclear that this is going to arrive at a nice closed answer. But as we'll see, it works out to be maybe not super nice, but it is a closed formula for this area. Another thing is, well, how do we know that this sum will converge? Well, let's observe that this can be thought of as an increasing sequence of partial sums, and it's most definitely bounded above by the area of the entire triangle. So by what is known as the monotone sequence theorem, we know that this thing converges. Another thing that I'd like to notice is that the side of the square always ends up being the shortest side of the next triangle. So let's see, our largest square has side length x1, and observe that the next triangle right here has shortest side x1. And then our next square has side length x2, and the shortest side of the remaining triangle is length x2 as well. And that, in fact, motivates us to make the following picture of what's happening at the nth step. And, well, let's get that picture on the board over here, and we're going to do a bit of work with that picture. Okay, so here's our picture of what's going on at the nth step. So I've got this shortest side length of the nth triangle as side length xn. And then, well, I've just set this side here to be yn, which is a little bit unnerving based off of how we usually call the x and y axis. But I think for our purposes here, it'll be okay. And then the hypotenuse is zn. And then let's observe that under this setting, we know that the length of this square is length xn plus 1. That's how we're defining these numbers xi by the length of the subsequent squares. Now, next up, I'm going to do a little bit of angle chasing in order to show that we actually have a bunch of similar triangles at work here. Before we get started, let's label all of the right angles. So this is pretty clearly the right angle of the largest triangle. Then we've got a triangle over here that has a right angle right here, and then one over here that has this as a right angle. Okay, cool. And now, well, now let's observe that this angle right here, when, which I'm putting in magenta, plus this angle right here that I'm putting in blue must sum to 90 degrees. And that's because, well, the angle sum of the triangle has got to be 180 degrees, and we've got a 90 degrees right there already. So let's just keep that in mind. Magenta plus blue is 90 degrees. 
But now let's observe that we've got a 90 degree angle here in the square. And so that means that this must be a blue angle. That's because well, we've got a line there. The whole thing is adding up to 180 degrees. So again, magenta and blue must sum to 90 degrees. But that means that we've got a magenta up here. And let's see, that tells us we also have a magenta right here for the same kind of reason. And then we've got a blue right here for, again, the same kind of reason. And now at this stage, well, what we'll really want to do is to get xn plus 1 in terms of, well, xn, yn, and zn. And then, well, we're also going to want to define a zn plus 1 and a yn plus 1. So I'm going to move this away a little bit just so that we've got some room here. And let's just point out that this is the length of the entire side, and then this Zn is also the length of the entire side. Okay, cool. And now, well, notice that this next triangle down the line, the hypotenuse is right here opposite this right angle, so that means starting here and ending here will give us Zn plus one. So over here, we've got our side length xn plus 1. So let's put that in there. And then notice opposite this magenta angle is the same thing as opposite this magenta angle. So this is going to be, let's see, yn plus 1. So we've got something like that going on at the moment. But now let's observe by similar triangles, we can set some equations up. For instance, we have xn over yn is the same thing as xn plus 1 over yn plus 1. And then we've got something similar for zn. So we've got xn over zn is the same thing as xn plus 1 over zn plus 1. But now let's observe that that's going to give us a way to find yn plus 1 and zn plus 1 in terms of well, xn, yn, zn, and then we're also going to need xn plus 1 for the moment. Okay, so let's write that down. So we've got yn plus 1 is in fact going to be equal to, let's see, xn uh, plus 1 times yn over xn, and then zn plus 1 has a fairly similar format, xn plus 1 times zn over xn. Okay, so those are two pretty nice formulas here. And then from here, what we'd like to do is get some sort of formula for xn plus 1 in terms of, well, just xn, yn, and zn. And then, well, we can plug that into what we have over there, and we can express all of these sides in terms of sides of the previous triangle, if you will. Okay. So how are we going to do that? Well, uh, using another round of similar triangles, but with this triangle up here, we can actually find, and maybe this will be a bit of a homework exercise, but we can find that this length, so this little length right here that I'm sneaking in, is in fact equal to, let's see, x in, times xn plus 1, xn plus 1 over yn. So we've got something like that. But now let's observe that we've got another copy of xn plus 1 right here. So in fact, we have yn plus 1 plus xn plus 1 plus this quantity must add up to the entire zn. So let's write that down. So like I said, we have yn plus 1, but I'm going to use that formula over there for yn plus 1, which is xn plus 1 times yn over xn plus xn plus 1. So there we've got our xn plus 1 plus this thing right here. So that's xn times xn plus 1 over yn has got to be equal to zn. So something like that. But now we can build ourselves a common denominator pretty easily. So let's do that by multiplying this by yn. That gives us yn squared. 
and then we'll multiply this by xn yn. So that's going to multiply this numerator by xn times yn to couple with the xn plus 1 that's already there. And then we'll multiply this by xn, giving us xn squared. And then we can multiply both sides of this equation by xn, yn, and factor an xn plus 1 out of that numerator. And we'll have xn plus 1 times yn squared plus xn, yn plus xn squared equals xn, yn, zn. And that gives us a nice formula for xn plus 1 in terms of xn, yn, zn. So let's write that down. So we have xn plus 1 equals, so it's going to be xn, yn, zn all over this thing. I'm going to write in alphabetical order. So xn plus 1 plus xn, yn plus yn squared. I should have said for the first one as well. Okay, so now let's see what we have. Well, we've got a formula for xn plus 1, yn plus 1, and zn plus 1 in terms of, well, after substituting xn, yn, and zn. But that means we've got this nice recursive formula for the side length of the square. Observe that all we really want is the side length of each square. And it's really not one recursive formula, it's this maybe tripled pair of recursive formulas but we don't quite have the length of the first square, but we can get that pretty easily. And we can do that by noticing in this original setup, we would simply have a equal to x naught, b equal to y naught, and z equal to, or sorry, c equal to z naught, meaning that our x1 will be equal to, well, this expression with these like starting terms. So we have ABC over A squared plus AB plus B squared. Okay, so let's summarize what we have so far and then maybe work towards our final goal. Okay, so, so far we've come up with the following maybe like governing formulas for our situation here. So we calculated the first side length of our first square in terms of the lengths of the sides of the triangle. And then, well, we've got xn plus 1 in terms of this xn, yn, and zn, which in turn can be calculated recursively from, well, the side lengths of the previous triangles, if you will. And, well, now the process is simply just a bunch of algebra. So a bunch of, maybe I should say symbolic manipulation. I like that word for doing this kind of stuff more than the word algebra. So we've got a bunch of symbolic manipulation leads us to see that x2 is in fact equal to a times b squared times c squared over a squared plus a b plus b squared quantity squared. So I think that's already looking like a nice formula. Notice it didn't really get any more complicated than x1. And then after that, we can similarly do a bunch of symbolic manipulation and get x3. And we'll see that x3 is a times b cubed times c cubed over a squared plus ab plus b squared to what power? Well, it's going to be cubed. Oh, but I think at this point, we can kind of see what the formula is. Notice that it seems like... So I'll just put this star for it seems like, and maybe we won't spend any time doing the hard calculation of showing this via induction, but you can do that if you want to. But it seems like x sub n is in fact equal to a times b times c over a squared plus ab plus b squared raised to the n power. So let's observe that x1, x2, and x3 follow that pattern. And in fact, if you calculate more, you'll see that it does. And also, in fact, if you do induction, you'll see that it all works out. Okay, so now let's go down here and let's rewrite this sum in summation notation. 
So this is the sum as n goes from one to infinity of, well, xn squared. Well, so notice that xn squared is gonna give us an a squared out front, because that's like a constant for each one. And then after that, we'll have bc over a squared plus ab plus b squared, all raised to the two n power. But now let's observe that that is a geometric series where the starting term is, well, this bc over a squared plus ab plus b squared all squared, and the common ratio, well, the common ratio and the starting term are the same. So that means we can use the standard formula for the sum of a geometric series, and we'll get something like this. So we'll get uh, a squared b squared c squared over a squared plus a b plus b squared all squared. So that's our starting term over, like I said, one minus the common ratio. So that's gonna be one minus, now we've got bc over a squared plus ab plus b squared all squared. And at this stage, what you would do is, well, you would do that simplification there. And maybe I won't go through the details, but you end up with something like this. So you get a squared, b squared, c squared over this quantity, which is a squared plus a b plus, plus b squared minus b c. And then that's going to be multiplied into, well, essentially the same thing, but with a plus b c. So a squared plus a b plus b squared plus b c. And that's the final value for our area. And that's a good place to stop.